all the preceding talks uh, rely on one thing, and that's coronary angiography. So we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about some of the basics of uh, coronary angiography. The uh, advent actually preceded the date that uh, uh, was previously mentioned, and that is in 1958, Dr. Mason Soans accidentally performed the first coronary angiogram. In those days, aortic root injections looking for coronary artery disease uh, was the only method. And you put a catheter in, bring it down to the aortic root. In this particular case, the catheter had inadvertently slipped into the right coronary artery and a power injection of 30 cc's of dye was made into the coronary artery, gave a beautiful arteriogram. A uh, patient had a temporary period of asystole, some pumping on his chest, and Dr. Soans was remarkable in taking something that could have been a catastrophic complication, and from that, deciding that this might lead to a way of doing selective coronary uh, angiography. Most people would have been happy they had a patient that survived and never did it again. But Dr. Soans started the, uh, the uh, field of coronary angiography by that inadvertent era. A big uh, advance was made in uh, 1967 when uh, Melvin Judkins in California designed some catheters that could be, that were pre-shaped, uh, found left coronary arteries and right coronary arteries fairly easily, and this opened up the uh, field to many, many people at that time, uh, radiologists initially, subsequently the field of coronary angiography and cardiology uh, grew and uh, superseded the radiology portion. But these same preformed catheters are still used today. Um, there are numerous approaches to coronary angiography. For many years, Dr. Soans sort of led the charge, and uh, we at Methodist Hospital did almost all the cases through a brachial arteriotomy, later uh, percutaneous uh, access via the brachial artery. Then the femoral artery became the mainstay. It's usually quick. Femoral arteries are usually big. Uh, you could exchange multiple catheters easily. If you had to do an intervention, it was easy to convert to uh, percutaneous intervention. Uh, but it was complicated in patients with iliofemoral disease. In the past several years, radial uh, access for coronary angiography has really uh, uh, taken charge and uh, growing uh, by leaps and bounds. And we previously heard uh, from Dr. Fujisi some of the benefits uh, to radial uh, angiography. The complications, fortunately, a few and far between. In elderly patients over the age of 70, uh, death is uh, one per thousand. In younger patients, it's one per three to 5,000. So it's a very safe procedure from the standpoint of uh, mortality. Most of the deaths occur in people uh, with some underlying disease, left main or, or uh, very poor heart function. Stroke remains a problem, but a rare problem, uh, either clot or air embolization. Uh, very typically, the first injection, a test injection, uh, which still has some residual air, leads to some uh, at least transient neurologic deficit. Displacement of, pack, of plaque from the ascending aorta is pretty uncommon, at least with the catheters used today. It's not that uncommon with the uh, stiffer catheters used for valvuloplasty or TAVR. Femoral access site complications are the most common complications uh, from uh, uh, coronary angiography. Bleeding in particular, occlusion very uh, uncommon. And this is one reason that radial artery access has uh, become more and more popular. 
Contrast-related complications are uh, common depending on how you define the complication. Uh, to date, the only things we know is that if you hydrate the patients well, you can reduce that incidence. There's been really no magical uh, preventive uh, uh, mechanisms for reducing renal complications. And coronary artery dissection is uh, very, very rare. Most catheters have a sort of a rubbery tip, which uh, makes them nice and uh, gentle on the coronary arteries. It's important to know, and it's fortunate, that the aortic root is a fairly simple uh, structure. You have uh, three sinuses of Valsalva and three cusps in most patients. Uh, the right coronary originates from the right, the left originates from the left, and if you could find a coronary artery in what's called the non-coronary cusp, you could report it and get it published in, uh, in a minute. Uh, there's never been one uh, re reported to occur. It's truly a well-named structure, the non-coronary cusp. Now, if you look at uh, coronary anatomy, uh, the CAS trial, one of its important contributions is definition of branches and segments to be analyzed. And this has gone into many of the anatomical uh, uh, definitions. Uh, and it looks rather complicated, but the fact is that uh, it really is not. At least coronary angiography is, is much more simple than the coronary artery anatomy. And you can boil this down to a couple of uh, important rules. Left coronary artery, if you want to look at the uh, left anterior descending system, the cranial views tell it all. This is uh, a P cranial, RAO cranial, LAO cranial. Between those three views, you'll see all you need to see of the left anterior descending. At the same time, the circumflex is viewed from the caudal views. So sometimes uh, the AP caudal, sometimes the RAO caudal, sometimes the LAO uh, caudal. I wind up using six views for the left coronary artery in, in most patients. But the caudal views for the circumflex. The right is simple as well. The body of the right, the LAO views, are uh, terrific. This could be a L regular LAO or LAO uh, cranial. The branches, you need something that profiles the branches. So this would be the RAO views. This is a straight RAO, but an RAO uh, cranial view is also uh, extremely helpful. So doing good, complete coronary angiography is much less complicated than coronary anatomy per se, but you have to be very careful that you uh, obtain the right views if you're searching for particular disease. Um, this slide illustrates the major limitations of coronary angiography, uh, which is, uh, uh, brought out by other techniques like uh, intravascular ultrasound. Uh, the slide on the left, there should be a little red center, but it shows that the, the lumen, and let me see if I could. Anyhow, in the center of that, uh, that diffuse disease should be a, a lumen. And if you project that, you see what looks like a smooth lumen. And in some patients, it looks a similar caliber throughout. In this particular case, you see that that center area is a relatively small part of the vessel. It's almost impossible to diagnose this as a severe disease if you're doing just an arteriogram. Uh, the other problem often is in eccentric lesions, which you see in the, uh, the right-hand panel. And this shows two views looking at a very severe but eccentric lesion. And these two views are orthogonal. They're 90 degrees. And we sometimes think that if you take orthogonal views, you'll 
be able to decipher uh, eccentric disease. But in this particular case, those two orthogonal uh, views show fairly good size lumen. If you take a view in between those two, uh, you would see a stenotic lumen. So be cautious about a, uh, an eccentric uh, lesion and obtaining multiple views is the way around that trap. There are certain strategies. Uh, Dr. Ramshandani mentioned uh, the importance of left internal mammary artery. Many of the cases we do now are post-cabbage patients, and the left internal mammary artery is a critical vessel uh, to a critical bypass to identify. Its origin is inferior, and that's what we usually use, but it's also anterior. So you have to sometimes manipulate that catheter to catch the osteum. We typically use a right coronary catheter, but a Lima catheter has a sharper angle and uh, hooks it a little bit better. Distal anastomosis is where you'll see a problem if there is a problem. As Dr. Ramshandani mentioned, you almost never see disease within the body of the lima, but you can see disease at the distal anastomosis. And almost every view that we routinely obtain has some overlap with the lima with that anastomosis. So to see that distal lesion requires a very steep LAO or better yet, a lateral view. A lateral view is absolutely ideal for that distal anastomosis. And one also has to visualize the distal LAD, often a site of disease, even with a patent uh, lima. Saphenous vein grafts, the right coronary artery graft, is easily cannulated in an LAO view. Sometimes its takeoff is directly inferior, and it requires a multipurpose, sort of a straight-tipped uh, catheter to get in and get good dive visualization. Left coronary artery grafts are cannulated in the RAO view. The RAO view, there's a hierarchy of grafts. The surgeon that puts them in, uh, puts them in so that there's no overlapping, crisscrossing of those grafts. So if somebody had five saphenous vein grafts and you identified one of them, you'd know where to look for the others. So you find, let's say, the, uh, the ramus, and you know that this patient also has a, an obtuse marginal bipe. That's going to be superior to it. A diagonal or an LAD will be inferior to it. And that rule is never violated, to my knowledge, on a first operation. Now, a second operation, the surgeon has to find some other site, so it becomes a little, uh, uh, a little trickier. But for a first operation, this sequence is always performed. Uh, common problems are poor opacification. This is a problem in obese patients, in patients with high coronary flow, aortic valve disease, uh, anemia. Uh, something that's less and less common is uh, poor x-ray equipment. But obesity is, is still a big, big issue. Obesity limits the angulation that you uh, can utilize. So partial fixes are almost always doable. And one thing that's really helpful now is using larger bore catheters. So we now have guiding catheters in almost every French size that give you better flow than the diagnostic catheters. And if you're unhappy with the angiographic appearance, change to the same uh, French size but a... Uh, an interventional guide, which will get you better flow. Higher frame, ro frame rates give you better resolution. This is sometimes helpful, particularly with the obese patient. And less angulation. Instead of oblique views, AP, uh, cranial, and caudal views have less tissue to uh, penetrate. And of course, more vigorous injections and uh, better cannulation. 
uh, common mistakes that are made is the failure to assess the quality of the images before removing the catheters. Uh, and I can't tell you how uncomfortable it is to finish a case and then go back and say, you know, I really don't see this lesion well. This is particularly uh, important in proximal LAD, where there's often overlap with circumflex, overlap with diagonal. It's also very critical in uh, osteal circumflex, where you need steeper caudal views. The lesions at ostea of branches, a common site of stenoses, requires sometimes multiple views to optimize that uh, visualization. And then there are some anomalous situations where you often miss. You think an audit, right coronary is occluded when it's really high anterior. You need uh, different catheters to find that. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen cases of what were reported as occluded circumflex, which really were uh, anomalous rising from the right coronary artery. And the catheter that slid into the right coronary slid past the origin of the circumflex, so you never visualized the uh, circumflex. It's important to assess collaterals. And you, to do this, you need more contrast and longer, longer uh, pump runs. But a good rule of thumb is that when you finish doing what you've done, review the pictures before stopping. And if you're not comfortable, go back and take a couple of more views. The additional contrast is rarely a big issue but missing important lesions or being in, unable to assess those lesions uh, is, a more, is a bigger problem. And that's some basics. Thank you.